Hello and welcome to the presentation by Mary Jones. Mary Jones was our Knox College artist in residence uh, last winter term of 2020 and we're excited to have her back and have her exhibition up at Borzello Gallery. Um, Mary Jones is originally from Pennsylvania, spent most of her life in Chicago where she built her career as an artist. She earned her BFA in art history from University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign and an MFA from printmaking from Indiana University at Bloomington. She's taught in higher education, most recently at Grandview University in Des Moines, Iowa. And she has worked in several public collections, including Illinois State Museum and Linda Lee Alter Collection of Art by Women at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Philadelphia. She's represented by galleries in Chicago, Milwaukee, and Des Moines, and her work has been featured in New American Paintings, number 45, the Midwest edition. She was awarded an Iowa Arts Council Fellowship in 2018 and currently lives and works in Indianola, Iowa. So welcome back, Mary. <laughs> um, kind of let you turn this over to you to briefly to, Mary's gonna flip through the, some slides and discuss her work. And then she and I will have a brief conversation afterwards. Well, Thank you, Andrea. Uh, it's really great to be back in Galesburg, even if it's only virtually. My show is called This Must Be the Place. And it's actually the title of a song. It is the last cut on the Talking Heads album, Speaking in Tongues. And this song is so much unlike the rest of the album. It's this it has a sweetness to it. And the rest of the album is really dance music, practically speaking. But This Must Be The Place is a, a song about belonging to a place called home. And it's also the answer to a question that I posed in the class that I taught last winter uh, at Knox. It was a printmaking class, but I had the students complete a suite of prints with a theme and they were to investigate the environment of their temporary home, which was Galesburg, and to find ways in which the inhabitants invest it with meaning. They were to look around and follow trails of meaning to see how beings function in space and how they relate to the place. So the question I posed to my class was, what is it that you call home? What are your markers? And for a long time, actually, up until a couple of weeks ago, I thought that what is it that you call home would be the title of this show. But then it, I think that actually this must be the place came on the radio and I thought, that's it. That's the title of the show. And it's also the answer to that question. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my working methods and then get and why I and so interested in this question. And then I'll talk about some representative pieces from various bodies of work that are in the show. I'm a walker. I've really all my life, I've spent a lot of time walking. Um, and I've also moved a lot. I've lived in a lot of different communities, small towns, and one big city, which was Chicago. Um, and I still do that a lot. That's how I engage with communities. And, and there's a concept that comes up uh, called Flannery that is my mode of inquiry. Um, Flannery was written about a lot in the 19th century. Um, I first encountered it when I taught 19th century art history. And um, it's a concept that a lot of people might know about from Charles Baudelaire who wrote about it in The Painter of Modern Life, but basically that a flaneur is a person who wanders in a detached way in order to get to know a place, in order to get impressions of place. But what really interests me is that most flaneurs, which is the masculine, um, are who are written about. And my question is, did women walk? Well, 
uh, George Sand wrote about walking and wearing men's clothing in order to do so safely. Um, women walking and what that's like is an area that really interests me. So when I think about walking and thinking about ways in which I relate to places, it's usually not uh, the places where you're supposed to walk. I even kind of think of them as forced marches. So if you think about a place you, you love and what it is about it and how you relate to it, for instance, if that place is New York City, is it the Brooklyn Bridge? Well, I, I've, I've been to New York many times and of course I've walked across the Brooklyn Bridge and it's a lot of fun, but it really does kind of feel like a, a forced march. And the other, the other image, the image on the right is of taken of walking in Des Moines. Uh, and it's more places like that that I get attached to. I call that the island of misfit stop signs. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of goofy intersections in uh, residential communities. And those are my markers. Those are the things I've become attached to. And by the way, that blonde head, the back of that head that appears in both images, that's my daughter. She's my best walking partner. When I'm walking, I like to stop along the way and take some notes and also uh, actually do some drawings as well. I'm really interested in places, public places that are comfortable to sit where anyone feels welcome and where anyone can spend a lot of time without feeling rushed uh, to leave. And really public libraries are a wonderful place for doing that sort of sitting. And otherwise it's kind of hard to find places, though I do have my favorite perches uh, the one on the left is uh, is the price chopper on Ingersoll in Des Moines, and people. It used to be a doll store, so you probably know it, Andrea. Yep, I miss the old, the big banister or bar tables. Yes, and that was that really created a sense of community. It it really did, and there's a fireplace, and there's a buffet that's now defunct sadly, um, and, and there's people who really spend a good part of the day there. And um, it, well, people used to call it Inger Dolls and now I call it Inger Chopper because it's <laughs> a price chopper. And then the other space, uh, the one on the right um, is a coffee shop in Urbana called Paradiso. And it really is paradise to just sit there in that wonderful big turquoise room. And I, when I'm there, I like to, my work incorporates a lot of drawing in my style. And I like to, the drawings to originate in those public spaces where I've been sitting, taking a break from walking. And so journals are really an important aspect of this work. And so this is a page out of a journal. Um, and that person, her name is Harriet, and she's one of several alter egos that I've developed over time. Now, the first map that I actually made that I realized was in on its way to becoming an art object, it was actually um, a chart that helped me navigate through an actual event. Uh, I worked with my students and an artist named Rada Buchanan who was doing a residency at the Des Moines Art Center. And his ideas really influenced me. He is for, he's from Glasgow and his first visit to Des Moines was this residency. And he felt that it's really important to engage with place 
in a way that is not the way in which you're expected to engage with it, that you have to kind of disrupt the expectations of, of a visit and do something else completely different. So he had us swim in three different pools every day in Des Moines. And so we had to put together a schedule and call people and say, hi, can we swim in your pool <laughs> and kind of explain it? So anyway, I had to have a map and I had to have a, a schedule. And the more I looked at this thing, the more I realized that it could become a really interesting object, um, art object. So for instance, I started to change it. So you can see that I actually moved Chicago so that it's right next to Des Moines, which certainly would make my life easier. And then I put Champaign-Urbana just slightly south. Um, and then this thing changed. <laughs> this is its eventual form. And it has a lot of notes in it. And I also, in order to get it to this place, I collaged on top of it and eventually scanned the whole thing and migrated it into Photoshop, which is one of many tools, but it's a tool that I use a lot. And then around about this time, I learned photopolymer intaglio, which is the method that I taught to students at Knox. And I like it because it's a great way to create hybrid imagery. It's a great way to combine text and photos and drawing. And Dear Cat Girl is actually uh, the first photopolymer that I made. And it's, I don't know why I decided to tackle this huge size. It's, it's about 11 and a half by 15. Um, but for the most part, it's a pretty good print. And it carries through this notion of mapping an urban environment and walking and the kind of people that one encounters on the street. And then this is another example of a piece that, that's, I tend to take pieces through more than one version. And this is the second version of I Walk Down Division. Um, because I have walked down division in Chicago many, many, many times. And so each time I generate new new memories. And even though I'm on division, I might be thinking about other places and other people. And so this piece is a print that's been, it's a combination actually of about six different prints that have been carefully cut and collaged on top of each other. Around about this time, a friend of mine who at the time was curating the gallery at, um, it's the Ralph Arnold Gallery at Loyola University in Chicago. And she is well acquainted with digital media and said to me, hey, couldn't, since the files you create for the prints are digital, couldn't you have those run out on window cling material? because she was curating the shows at the gallery and that gallery has three eight by eight foot windows on it that face Sheridan Road. So uh, I did as she suggested. I did a piece that is about Sheridan Road and it incorporates a lot of imagery that's right out on the street. And so this is the show and one of the most interesting views of the show is from the street at dusk when if the gallery is lit you can see the back wall of the gallery you can see the images on the window cling and you can also see reflections in the window 
uh, so there are really many levels of, of reality to viewing this show. Um, the window clings, I, a, a professional installed and I tried to do this same concept um, on my own and found out that you need professional, <laughs> I anyway need professional installers uh, to install cling material on windows that big. I then did another piece that, then I started really working in series. And I had a residency at uh, Anchor Graphics at Columbia College in Chicago. Sadly, Anchor is, is not there in that location anymore, but it used to be an absolutely heavenly uh, residency for printmakers. And I did this series about walking on Lincoln Avenue. And here I need to go into another concept a little bit just to explain the title. It's called Lincoln Avenue, a deep map. And um, just what is deep mapping? Well, it's a creative approach to creating maps, which interweaves many disciplines and really focuses on story and cultural geography. And it looks at exactly the question I posed to students. How do the inhabitants of a place infuse it with meaning? And so there's usually layers uh, in deep maps and really any information is valid. Hearsay is just as valid as geological features. And that's why um, I like that term deep mapping. It actually comes from William Least Heat Moon and the book that he wrote about his investigations of Chase County in Kansas. And part of his investigation was, was walking all of the section roads. But anyway, I walked about nine miles of Lincoln Avenue. And so I combined actual views with um, my impressions over various times when I had walked on Lincoln Avenue at the time of my residency, my sister lived on Lincoln Avenue and my mother and my grandparents I knew had taken the streetcar up Lincoln Avenue to visit relatives. Uh, and I knew that those streetcar tracks are buried under the asphalt in the street. So I was looking at a lot of layers of, of history and stories that I had heard. Um, so several of these prints are in that show. I also was interested in Lincoln Avenue because it's a state road that has lost some of its usefulness because it's been replaced by interstate. And that happens in a lot of communities. I'm also got interested at this point in superimposing an actual street map, uh, which is an aerial view with um, what is actually an elevated view um, of a place. And I, part of what I'm doing here is defeating um, perspective and everyone Every art student at some point in time learns classic linear perspective, uh, usually two point perspective, and it's a rite of passage. I've taken great glee in defeating that. And though I, I still use a horizon line frequently, I like to have it kind of shifting about. I was, I was interested in these and the, what you're talking about, the superimposing the map and how it also, it functions like architecture 
yes it becomes an architectural structure that plays plays with and against yeah perspectival rules yeah so so you you saw that and yeah. and probably deal with it a lot <laughs> you know in your own work figuring out really a lot of the problems that i think about and that i'm solving are formal because really no matter how rich and exciting an idea might be if it doesn't work formally it's just not going to work <laughs> so there's always composition problems that i'm dealing with now there is a video and several paintings that are really all part of one project that is called 14th Street Flaneuse. And if or when you've been to the gallery, you, you have an opportunity to look at the video. Uh, it's a, it lasts two and a half minutes. And um, it's, a, it's all about a walk down 14th Street in Des Moines. Now, 14th Street is very similar to Lincoln Avenue in that it is an a state road that's really been supplanted by uh, Highway 65, and then um, also functionally by King Drive and by 235, which was originally the McVickers Parkway. You know about these things, Andrea, from having lived in Des Moines. And you've probably been on 14th Street. Oh, the street, yep. <laughs> and no one likes it. But this still from the video is, you can see that it's, it's taking that idea even further of using, here I used the actual street map and really I drew over it. There's little pieces of, of, it, of it remaining, but I used uh, the city blocks as little windows. Um, and it's even fairly accurate. I got the Capitol in there pretty close to where, no, nah, that's not where the Capitol is. Anyway, uh, there's the video and three of the paintings from this series are there. So this is what 14th Street actually looks like. And I, it's uh, a product of what's fondly known by urban planners as a post-pedestrian city. And you can see that the sidewalk stops and starts. In fact, for some reason, there's something there just obstructing the sidewalk entirely. Um, it's very noisy. Um, it, it's interesting to me that when I, Des Moines seemed noisy to me. And that's because the speed limit uh, on, on a lot of these major thoroughfares is either 35 or 40. And I was used to Chicago where the speed limit is 30. And in older cars, there's kind of a threshold. And once they get up over 35 miles an hour, it gets noisier. Now, now that there's hybrid vehicles and, and newer cars, um, it's not so much as a, of a problem, but frankly, no one is really supposed to walk on those sidewalks on 14th Street. Um, and it's downright painful to do so. This is also the route I took to work. And so I decided that I needed to experience this route differently. And so I only really walked six miles of it and not at one time um, because I would then have to, I do some miles and then have to backtrack to get back to my car because that bus, it runs, but really only every half hour. And even that part of it is, is a little more un unpredictable than one would like it to be. I, sometimes costume when I walk. And that's, I'm, what I'm doing is testing out how different identities perform. 
uh, in a public place. And part of this idea came, I got from George Sand. She had to wear uh, men's clothing. And, and it's, you know, a lot of people have interpreted her doing that as um, a statement about gender, but it was pro probably had more to do with safety. And she does even write about the fact that it's a heck of a lot more comfortable to walk in boots than women's shoes. Um, but I, the, the Harriet is the, the person with the black skirt. And if you've been to the gallery, you've seen that I use that big black skirt primarily as a compositional device, but Harriet appears a lot. And she's kind of difficult to tie to, she's probably feminine, but she's difficult to tie to any particular time period or even age. But the dude, this is a person that I encountered a lot walking on 14th. And that um, plaid shirt with the hoodie on it and um, the stocking cap is a, is a kind of a, a uniform that I saw a lot. Um, so that's who he is. But you know, those plaid shirts with the hood on them are really easy to come by um, at Goodwill. So I acquired one of those and tried walking as the dude as well. And here are the paintings. And um, that's most of this. I started out with an accurate street map and the major thoroughfares do cross the Des Moines River at those places. The bridges are accurate. And then I, the composition just starts to change into something that's a little more convenient. Um, here Harriet is wearing pants, but she has those eyes, which is a pattern that I, I use a lot. And that's the looking shirt. Um, when the eyes are on a skirt, Harriet is wearing the looking dress. And the eyes, or because Harriet is looking, she's the detached observer, but she also knows she's conscious of being looking at, looking, looked at. So that's a part of the journey too. And sometimes in, in these, the street map started to appear on people's clothing. Um, I incorporated some photos uh, and also some stills from the video into these pieces as well. And here's another piece. Who are the people? They're, they're based on people that I couldn't really get out of my mind. In part because it's really difficult to classify people and I really think it's kind of dangerous to try to put people in categories. Um, in, the, in the days when Flannery, you know, middle, late 19th century, when Flannery was written about, people actually carried guidebooks, type, typology guidebooks with them to put people into categories. And um, there was an interest in the science of physiognomy, you know, typing a person in, in because of the shapes of their heads or their faces. And there's, you know, it's othering. There's a dangerous in that. And I, I'm really not trying to other. Um, I'm recreating personas that I encounter when walking. I, I hope that, that I've made, there's some differentiation there that's, that's clear. But that's kind of what I'm up to here. And that's who these people are. And it seems like some people are trying to get our attention and other people are trying to kind of retreat into the space or even when they're having the 
maps going over the clothing become part of that space. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really well put, Andrea. Um, because it, I mean, there's a real difference too that I noticed walking in Des Moines and particularly places like, like 14th Street, that's the kind of transgression that Roddy Buchanan was talking about. You're not supposed to walk there and you don't dress for the street like people do in Chicago. I mean, if you if you walk on Milwaukee Avenue and on a commercial section now that's been all that's gone through a few transformations, boy, people are really dressing to be seen, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but for the most part, that's really not what's happening on this walk. Um, though there would occasionally be people who wanted attention. And I, I found that sometimes people would stare at me. The most annoying, annoying thing is that a lot of people would honk. And I don't, I really don't know why they would do that. Pedestrians don't like to be honked at. <laughs> but if I had to cut through a parking lot, boy, is that disturbing to get honked at. But it's, it's the, the relationship between vehicles and pedestrians is really, really a fraught one in Des Moines. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not a walking city in, in general. I feel no. like if people are walking, it's because they're out walking their dog or you see someone walking their dog and you know then what they're doing. But otherwise, this idea of someone just walking around, you know, you, you're kind of skeptical of why they're there especially if it's not in a major urban part of town. Yes. I, I've noticed myself seeing people here in Galesburg and it, like my instant thought is like, oh, what are, what are they doing? Why are they just walking? <laughs> you know, they don't have a dog. They're not in, you know, workout clothes or so it's, that's I really myself thinking those things. This, that's really true. And I did, I, of course I did a lot of walking in Galesburg. Um, and I, I found that very true there too. And it's kind of, you know, Flannery was about intentional strolling. But, and it's really interesting to me that strolling has been relegated. You know, walking has kind of come back and there's places in Des Moines where you're supposed to walk now. There's a really nice river walk and there's a, there's a footbridge. But that's not really where I want to walk. I feel like that's the parts of the city I'm supposed to see, you know? But in Galesburg, I would walk on Main Street a lot, but if you walk under or over the overpasses, there are people, I, I don't know if there's people living under the underpass, but there's some people who may well be homeless. Um, under one of the underpasses. And there, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of suspicion. Why are you walking here? Um, so yes, that's one of the things that really interests me. Here, I can't play the video. It's, it's very big because it's a stop motion animation. The file is enormous. That file is three gigabytes. But this is the entire file in strips so that uh, you can see it as still. And, and why did I make this? It was sort of a turn that took place in my mind. I was, you know, doing that much walking in those long walkings, it's kind of tiring. So I finally got to a place where I thought, okay, I've done the moving. Now it's time for the artwork to move. And so I had collaborators on this piece. Um, I had uh, Cindy Wiley, who is a friend and a collaborator and a, a digital genius, figured out how to make this move. So she did the animation. And then I had... Um, uh, my friend and collaborator, Judith Matthews, 
uh, who is a musician and a composer. She is in Evanston, Illinois, and she um, hired musicians and she came up with a sound for this piece. The piece is collaged visually. And so she came up with um, a sound collage and she was going to construct the whole thing because she walked 14th Street with me. <laughs> she came good to Des Moines. And, yeah, uh, so believe me, good friend to do that. Um, but she, she heard some things that I hadn't heard. She talked about the birds. Um, I don't hear birds when I'm walking on 14th. But anyway, she gave me several soundtracks and then um, I did the mixing and figured out what should go in what place. So here it is, um, still. <laughs> now we're moving into the next project, which I did with my daughter and we walked in Chicago, which is where she was born and where I used to live. And now she's back living there again. So she wa has walked there a lot and so have I. And I realized too that we did a lot of walking there before she was even born. Um, we also walked a lot in Brooklyn where she used to live. And then we walked a lot in Des Moines. And it's, we don't see each other often enough. We haven't lived in the same city for many years now. And walking is how we reconnect when we are together again. So no matter where we're walking, we're talking about different places and times. So there's three of these pieces in the gallery, um, but they all contain scenes from all three cities because our minds and, and imaginations are wandering through many, many places. With these pieces, I was playing with scale. I usually, my work is very small and I wanted to force myself to work large. So in order to do this, I started with some elements and then had them output. Um, very large, three by six feet about on a high quality. Uh, it's a pigment inkjet plotter um, that they have at Beeline here in Des Moines. And I had a grant from the Iowa Arts Council to do this. Otherwise I wouldn't have been able to afford it. But I wanted to see what would happen. I wanted them to feel sort of chart-like. I wanted them to hang on a wall and I wanted to be able to add to them over time. Yes, yes, they feel like something that are not, not unresolved in progress, but that, yeah, they feel like something you'd have up on your wall and be continuing to add to. And Good, because if that's exactly what I, what I wanted the feel of them to be. You know, almost like um, guilty pleasure, crime shows. <laughs> and you know how everyone is always studying this diagram and connecting the dots. Um, I wanted them to have, you know, not that purpose, but that presence mm -hmm. in a room. And who knows, I might go back and rework these again because when I do hang them up, um, there's all, always little dissatisfactions arise or else I visited that time again and had further thoughts. And that's how memory works. Every time we remember, we're actually rewriting the last memory of that place and that phenomenon kind of fascinates me. That brings up when you talked earlier about different levels of reality as to give memory and time and how we experience that and the, the deep mapping of our own memory versus just place. Yes, yes. Some parts will be very specific, but other parts will be 
very dreamy. Um, the memories are unclear. Or else it's, it's, it's sometimes there's, I think that walking can be pure desire. On one level, it's needing to get someplace. But on another level, it, it frees up your mind, particularly when a rhythm is established and your heart rate is up a little bit and your breathing becomes regular. It's, it's, it's incredibly freeing. And you can be very much in the moment and engaged with what it is that you're passing at every moment, but also the past and the future are right there in the rhythm of your moving forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And I think on one of your first images, you had the quote of you can't step in the same stream twice. Yes. Think about that on walks and how you might be doing the same route, but each time you discover something new, you see something you didn't notice before. It's getting rewritten. Yeah. Now I'm gonna move forward into the work I did in Galesburg. And um, really I'm amazed at, you know, by the time I left, I thought, oh gosh, I didn't get anything done. But that's really not true. I'm, I'm realizing that a lot happened. Um, and if you're in Galesburg, you probably recognize several of these buildings. Uh, one of the most wonderful parts of my residency was the opportunity to live in Gale House, which is just talk about layers of history. Uh, they're so evident there. And it's one of those neighborhoods that is transitioning some, and it's a wonderful place to walk. And um, this, this piece is called Keystones because I was really struck by the grand old mansions in the historic district and how they tend to have arches as entryways. And in thinking about what welcomes us, where do we feel comfortable? Where do we feel at ease? I thought, are, are these arches are they a welcome or are they a bit intimidating? And then, so these figures are imitating that gesture. And I'm struck by how that is a kind of an awkward human gesture and it's a little vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's also, I don't know, to me, engineering and physics are still magic. <laughs> And it's, I can still be amazed that it's the keystone that makes an arch work. It looks like the most vulnerable part, yet that's what gives it its stability. That's what holds it together. And so I'm kind of contrasting that to the human gesture and uh, to just what, what our reaction to a very large imposing arched doorway is. So that's kind of what this piece is about. Um, is that something new where the figures, I mean, the figures always have particular gestures they hold. they're holding and, you know, evoking different feelings or moods that they might be in. Um, but is that where the figures are actually imitating the architecture, is that new in these? It's, it's something that I finally realized. I think so much of creating, for me anyway, I won't realize until I'm done with something, oh my gosh, now I know exactly what that trope is about. And I'm realizing in this piece that yes, indeed that's happening, but there are a lot of gestures now that I'm starting to realize that I put in pieces frequently and uh, their reactions. And they tend to be ambiguous reactions. 
um, is dude over there um, on the left. Is he saying back off or is he, or is that a welcoming gesture? I'm not sure. And I think many environments feel that way. Should I, should I be here? <laughs> um, and I, I think that communities, environments, the street, they all have messages. There are strong messages. And I, I kind of think of it as street rhetoric. What am I being told here? And then what messages am I imparting? That really, that, those are the ideas that I'm really working with. By the way, I, maybe you remember, this is actually a digital print that I painted and collaged on top of. I did make a plate. And this is the last thing I did in Galesburg. Um, Illinois suddenly shut down. The students all found out they had to go home. There were a lot of tears shed. <laughs> I packed up my stuff and I was determined to make one final plate. I didn't have time to print it, but I made the plate and I still have not had the opportunity to print it. So I printed out the, a digital version and just worked on top of that. And then I made this set of prints um, that are all about being in the Midwest and living in, in the Midwest again. Rock River, um, I used to live in Sterling, Illinois. And if you, it, and I, I found when I told my students that, that some knew Sterling, some didn't. It's a river town, but I remember being in Galesburg made me think about it. Um, it. It's actually on 88. So, you know, it's not all that close, uh, but it is in Western Illinois. And I remember when uh, one summer I was on crutches, which is a horrible thing to happen during the summer if you're only 11 years old, but I remember laying in bed, looking at my hand and thinking, oh, if you look at your right palm, the Rock River is your heart line. <laughs> and I, that was just how my mind was working. And I just like that being able to find a map, even in one's palm. And um, there's a combination of imagery here. You, you may recognize in particular that one. I know Andrea, you recognize that house that's in Galesburg. I'm really fascinated by the duplexes in Galesburg. They're all probably built turn of the century into the twenties and thirties. And they're really wonderful buildings. And there sure are a lot of them. Now, one of my friends lived in a duplex like that in Sterling. And so that's kind of what brought it to mind too. And then twigs is, you know, as the winter wears on in Illinois, you get used to staring at bare trees and really, really praying for spring. But yeah. I was, yeah. But I was also starting to see some visual equivalencies uh, people have said that my, the people that I draw are kind of twig-like. I think that may be quite true, but then there's also um, a photo of a map of the watershed around Galesburg too, which has that, you know, fingers, twigs kind of feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, but these figures, all four of these six prints have that central figure with the wide skirt. And you know what? It's, it's really a compositional device <laughs> more than anything else. 
and it's a classic compositional device too. So like a one point perspective view bringing us. Bringing yep. Us yep. Creating a, a pyramid as, as a composition. And that's something, you know, doing a small, medium, large thing. I think a lot of my work comes out of teaching for so many years and teaching so many of those foundational things about seeing yep. and composing. Um, could you, maybe we're going to get to this, but could you talk more about your, the use of text? Um, you have handwriting and collaged in and maybe less in this one of other forms of writing, newspaper clippings, but we have curious about the role of text and how you approach that. Oh, thank you for mentioning that because it's, I forgot to mention it, but it's obviously a really important part of my work. Um, and it comes from my interest and it also comes from, I see drawing, the way that I draw is very intuitive. Um, I, I don't do a lot of observational drawing anymore. I think it's very, very important. Um, my goal is to have my drawing and handwriting really kind of one and the same. I think of both as mark making and actually my handwriting, I think, and my drawing are, are very similar at this point. I also, early on, um, when I was in art school, and kind of trying to figure out, well, where do I fit? What, what do I do here that feels right? Where, where can I best express myself? Um, what is the work that I can really relate to? Well, guess what? I didn't really start to see uh, until it took a trip. I, I went to school in Champaign-Urbana took a trip up to Chicago and went into Phyllis Kine Gallery. And at that time, she was had a lot of the, the, the later piece of the imagists, the, the Harry Who people. But she also showed a lot of outsider work, uh, work by self-taught artists who quite naturally uh, just embraced that impulse to combine to write all over their drawings, to tell you in two ways what something is about. Um, I saw it and I thought to myself, that's it, I get it. And then I think that this wanting to combine text and image, um, well, it, it comes from two other places. I'm also very interested in data <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm interested in collage and unexpected juxtapositions, but I'm equally interested in intentional juxtapositions. And I really, I spent many, many years teaching graphic design. And I've had some great conversations with Tim about this too. Um, Tim Steadman, who teaches graphic design at Knox. Um, and I keep working with students to recognize that, you know, when you're designing, you got two things to work with, words and pictures, text and image. And the task at hand is to get them to talk to each other so that they aren't repeating the same thing, so that the text is enhancing the images and the images are enhancing the text. And it's a conversation. And so I think that's what I try to do in my work too. So that you're reading and looking at the same time and that those two things are working together. Is yeah, that I mean, they, they bring a sense of intimacy, both in the sense of a, like they force the viewer to get up close, you know, to really try to see what's what's going on, what they're reading, 
and bringing forth your own approach that feels like journalistic, very personal. So I like I like how you're doing that. And and also it's with the images and the text, they both are sometimes whole and sometimes fragmented. You know, there's fragments that we can't decipher what is going on exactly with found text, it looks like. And different languages. Like it's not all English. And I'm curious to yeah, hear where that that came from too. Oh, I, you know what? You're really helping me to understand the work. And I'll, uh, the fragments, um, where they come from, part of them come from, you know, I talked about having perches like Inger dolls. <laughs> when I was still living in Chicago, uh, one of my best perches was um, this kind of awkward seating area at DePaul University. It was in it. It, it's now a Barnes and Noble, um, but it used to be a bunch of tables um, that were out in kind of a lobby area. And of course, a lot of DePaul students um, are international. And so there were plentiful newspapers there that would be in Arabic or Chinese. And, and I, I loved picking up, you know, I, I like to pick up discarded things and then incorporate them into the work. And so I also loved hearing people talk sometimes in English, sometimes not, but looking at these papers. Um, and also some of those papers are printed in, in on different colored newsprint. So I had some green papers and a pink paper um, that I would use and then eventually they fade. But that's where the different languages come from. But then there's also some pieces. There is a little chunk of something that you can see up in the upper left hand corner of twigs that is actually the garbage that gets spit out by a malfunctioning laser printer. Yeah, I can see it. it's kind of that idea of a, a glitch almost running through there. Yes. Sometimes the, the way the space is organized also feels like that too, like things align, but then they kind of, you know, glitch and don't, don't quite all make logical sense. Oh, that's so true. Um, I, I do like to embrace, embrace the glitchiness. Uh, space glitches all the time. The streets don't intersect the way they're supposed to. Ah, I think it's reflected in the awkwardness of the people too. Odd juxtapositions. So now, um, itching with ghosts. Oh boy, these are my, these are my Galesburg pieces. Uh, itching with ghosts is actually a quote from Dorothea Tanning, who is Galesburg's other famous resident, um, other than Carl Sandburg. Though it's interesting to me that both of them uh, <clears throat> ended up in Galesburg because their both families were Swedish immigrants. And I believe both families ended up here or in Galesburg because of the railroad. Um, but I was fortunate enough to be uh, at Knox when um, Alice Mayen came to give that wonderful talk about tanning and she was in Galesburg to do research. She's a tanning expert, but she'd never actually seen the home or the, the place where Dorothea had lived. And Itching with Ghosts comes, is a line from her memoir called Birthday, which is such a good book. And uh, she <laughs> doesn't have a lot of positive things to say about Galesburg. She actually attended Knox for two years and she doesn't have a lot of great things to say about Knox either. Well, actually what she says is that they tried to teach her 
really the the public library um, is where she found the world. Um, but anyway, uh, she came back to visit, of course, to see family, but not real frequently. And here's what she had to say. Uh, she and she's here. She's describing her childhood to her partner, Max Ernst. And this is a quote. Can this be Main Street so queerly empty to the eye, so drab and quiet, itching with ghosts in the crisscross gusts that sweep clean like a broom past empty store windows and that separate the dust on the inside from the dust in the street. And Did I hear that. What year was that from? It, it doesn't say. I'm not sure which visit that was, but I'm guessing it would have been sometime in the 40s or 50s. Feels relevant. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought when I read that. Um, I was sitting in, in one of the parlors in Gale House, and I'm thinking, well, you know what? On a Sunday night in the dead of winter, <laughs> That's Main Street, kind of feels like that. Uh, and she writes about the train station and she writes about the theater and it's just, it's still so relevant. And another thing she writes about, well, it, it, actually the most famous quote um, from Birthday, and here I probably can't quote it exactly, but she says, Galesburg is that place where you sit on the sofa waiting to grow up. <laughs> and she talks about her mother's color scheme and how uh, her mother was careful to follow this color scheme and, and her hand, handiwork uh, and in the house. And so I looked around and thought, you know, Gale House has a really distinctive color scheme. And there sure is a lot of that faded gold kind of color. And there's a heck of a lot of kind of dusty pink. Now there's also a nice green and a lot of deep red too. So these two peaches, which are hanging side by side um, are called Itching with Ghosts, one and two. And that is my Gale House color scheme. And I realized too that color is so much of a quality of place. And, and really, Gale House is not that oppressively pink, not at all. But it also got me thinking that I really want to, looking at that show, I thought, oh gosh, I have to learn how to work with color. And I also want to work with interiors more. That's the question I was going to ask, because they all, they're all about being out in the world and being outdoors and you're talking about the interior of Gale House and I think of our current situation where we're not able to move move out in the world as freely you know as you were and yeah, how how when and if the interior might make its way into the work and and yes it has and okay, yeah. part of it is being indoors and and part of it too I have to say being at Knox um as you know uh, the art faculty, you all work with color and you're all, <laughs> for the most part, abstract artists. Um, so that was intimidating to me, but I also learned a lot. And you and I have had a, a couple of conversations about color and now I know I need to talk to you more about color because that's what you work with, right? Structure, yeah, architecture. So I, I, yeah, I like, yep. the, I, I empathize with a lot of that, thinking of how space flips relationship to architectural structures and sense of interior versus exterior. And, and, and yeah, but some of the other works where you have the architectural structure and you kind of talked about, yeah, this kind of window into the world that, yes. Yeah. So I'll be excited to see, see what you do. I, I think color is the next challenge. In fact, those two little red pieces. I didn't include those in this presentation because um, they're st really strictly an experiment. You know, I, I really thought 
got to start working with color. I'm never too old to learn. And I wanted, uh, I, I wanted something that, that came off of the wall and something that you'd notice simply because of the color and something that you, you could look at without having to first bury your nose in it. Um, so that's my next challenge. And then I, I felt like I kind of had to put an image of this in this show because it, it, it's so different from the rest of the pieces. And I thought there might be questions about it, but it's also the, the last one that I finished. So I put it in here and it's also different media. It's called Route 20 because um, this darn thing is actually 20 years old. It has been parts of it are. It's been torn apart and reconstructed three times now. Um, and it's also making another visit uh, to this part of the world. And, and quite frankly, it, the, the second version of this piece was in a show at St. Ambrose that I had a number of years ago. And when, <laughs> when I knew that I was coming to Galesburg, um, it, it made me think of um, Chris Reno, who is a Knox alum. He now is at St. Ambrose. He, I believe he's still running the gallery there. I'm yeah. not sure, yeah, I think so. but I thought I had abandoned this piece and cut it up and reassembled it since that show. And then, and I still didn't like, and then I thought, okay, it's time to pull it out again. So I did. And I can't, it, it's an experiment. It's, it's one of those uh, events in every artist's life where you have to just try to do something new and give yourself permission to fail. So I don't know, but it's hanging up there in the wall. <laughs> And the jury's still out. I don't. I would don't think it's a fail. I think it's it's exciting bringing the tactility into the into the show. The rest of the work is you know very flat, mount, mounted on panel, and it it does shift the conversation when it becomes this more of an object. Um, and the slowness of the hand stitching. And you know, and I was looking at this and wondering. I mean, you would you would you work with found material at some point, or found fabrics, or? I yeah, I I think that it may. Now I'm going to have some decisions to make because um, this was a very time-consuming experiment too. Uh, but yeah, I think I I what you said about tactility. I think that's I think that's really important, and I I had felt a need to do that. Something that's not in the show, but that I do do uh, is a lot of book binding. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of, right now I'm working on some pieces for a show that includes several books. And um, they're sewn, the, the sewing is, is very visible. And I'm using all kinds of, I'm incorporating lots of different materials um, I'm actually sewing some plastic bags, cut up plastic bags into these pieces because in part, because I'm like everybody else have ordered a lot of stuff because I'm being real careful. I'm not going out. So I've got all of these bags <laughs> that I don't know what to do with. So yeah, there's, there's some found materials in this too. But also all the imagery in here is reproduced. I don't know about that. Part of it is an effort to get, to get it. it it's really interesting that a lot of the materials that are, are used are gonna disintegrate, even the drawings, if they're done on newsprint or some type of paper that's gonna disappear. But then, if you scan them and print them out on a pigment inkjet, 
printer on archival paper, <laughs> they become archival. So, you know, I'm kind of dealing with that disparity too. That's really the end of the pieces I wanted to show, but I wanted to um, mention here's, here's birthday, which is of course a wonderful read. And then I, I don't even know if I mentioned it, but I'm as influenced by what I read as by what I look at. And um, Street Haunting, A London Adventure is a book about a walk that Virginia Woolf took in London and just all the places that her head goes while she's walking. And she really is just a wonderful writer. And she says so eloquently a lot of the things that I was thinking about in making this work. So I wanted to be certain to give her credit to yeah, thanks. That was, that was great. I, when I was at the gallery, I ran into a student who asked me to ask you what your inspirations were. And I think you definitely covered it. Hopefully, her question. Um, one thing that might be helpful <clears throat> to talk about a little bit for students is how did you arrive at your visual language, or some people call it your style? You know, like how did your your characters? Um, I see, you know, the works in conversation with other Chicago imagists work, but you have your own, you're recognizably your characters and I'd be curious to think students be curious to hear you talk about how you arrived or you did with that. You know, I think that's, that's something and by mentioning the images, yes, it's true. And I spent really most of my life so far in, in Chicago. The Art Institute is my museum. I, th I think everyone has a museum that goes back to childhood that, you know, um, is really important. And that's part of it. Um, and, and here's where I, it, I really should have images as some of the artists that's, that have influenced me. Uh, beyond the images, I look at who they were looking at. Um, when I lived in Chicago and was a young artist, I looked at a lot of Hala Sigler's work. And then I realized later that she was probably looking at Gertrude Abercrombie and Florine Stettheimer, who are two other artists that I just love. Um, there's a couple of paintings of, of Lionel Feininger's paintings in the Art Institute. And his, he did them, it's the, I think they both date from 1905, 1907, perhaps five to 10 years after that. But he did those at about the same time or when he was transitioning out of being an illustrator and he did a regular a comic page for the Chicago Tribune. Now I too worked as an illustrator for many, many years. And so I think there's a quality of that in the way that I draw, mm -hmm. but th those particular figures, the way that I draw came out of many years of just drawing a whole heck of a lot. And eventually my hand and my style evolved into something that's unmistakably just the way that I draw stuff. Yeah. It feels, yeah, it feels not like it was in part of a natural evolution, which I think a lot of times you know, students are anxious to, you know, find their style, but it's, I think it is about evolving and trying things out and letting the work evolve over, over time, become more particularly yours. It, it does. It, it simply takes a lot of time. Your work has a really identifiable particular hand to it too. I think that it does, you know? I feel all over the place and I'm yeah, constantly questioning that too. But and I think that's, you know, part of being an artist and, you know, I'm not 
we're not trying to just make make the same thing, but inevitably your your hand is going to come out and have a presence in the work. I think so, and it's 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 the mark that you put on things, and it's something that you can control as much that you cannot. Yeah. But it gives it's what makes work human. You right. know, it's why we we relate to it. But I, I you know, I find that a a, a lot of the young artists, students that I've worked with, the, the first goal is to be able, is observational drawing. Yep. And you know what? I'm kind of fair to Midland at it. Mm -hmm. I'm not that good at it. And the marks that I make when I'm looking at something else just don't quite cut it. And you know what? There's plenty of people out, of, out there who are really, really good at that. And so, you know, if it's not the thing you're best at, start finding the other directions to move in. And what you're excited about. Yes, yes. I, I, I you know, I think trying to encourage students to trust, trust following that, you know, following that curiosity and conviction of what you're, you're really interested and excited about. And, and have confidence in that, that it's, it's okay to just, go down that rabbit hole and then you know what every failure is is just another opportunity to learn yeah you'll find plenty of other rabbit holes <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes there's there's certainly out there um we should wrap up for now if if people have questions can they contact you further and you'll also be back at the end of march to get your show so hopefully maybe there might be an opportunity for students to talk with you and um yeah you're also welcome to email me questions and i can pass them put you in touch with with mary sure i'm i'm more than happy to answer questions i had some great students at knox um who were just so curious and, and really, I thought very confident about their abilities to express themselves. Um, many of them were, were had a double majors in creative writing, which was a lot of fun too. Yeah, it's a nice overlap. Printmaking and the creative writing world go, go well together. Great overlap. Yeah. I, I do have one final image and that's just thank yous but i think that they're really important to include here oh oh no i forgot about this this is another inspiration um about a month after i moved to chicago many years ago i got this fortune in a fortune cookie and it's a little like looking at my palm for direction i i was just i felt like i knew what this meant but i didn't if you would know and not be known, live in a city. I I, re I feel like I understand that feeling. Yeah, and I've I've included an image of this fortune in many of my pieces. But here are just many many of the people that I would like to thank. Yeah, wonderful, and thank you, Mary. And great having you at Knox and now you're we're excited to have your work finally back and encourage everybody to go check out the the show and yeah be in touch with questions so thanks a lot Andrea